Okay, before starting, I will uh, introduce Professor Manuel. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for your um, humbleness and to accept this talk to us. And she will talk about uh, chiral kinetic theory, mass corrections, and quantum coherent states. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, and thanks for the invitation. Um, I was asked to talk about this topic of uh, chiral kinetic theory and about including mass corrections and quantum coherent states. It's a little bit technical, uh, the topic itself, because it's about the formalism, it's about developing a formalism. Uh, I will try to be not so much technical. I mean, let's see how far we can go in this direction, but you can always interrupt me, please, if there is something that is not clear. Um, all this is all this is uh, all what I'm going to tell you about today is uh, work I've been doing in collaboration with Juan Torres Rincón and also with Stefano Carignano, who are uh, right now in the University of Barcelona. Okay. Okay, so um, as outline of, of the talk, I will first devote some time uh, to the introduction and the motivation of, of the topic. <clears throat> Although I've seen that maybe one of the organizers uh, is an expert on, on this, so I don't know much about the others. Um, so I will be a little bit more, more conceptual in this part. Also about uh, se semi-classical limits. Okay. And then the second part might be a little bit much more technical because I will introduce all these effect effective field theory methods that we have developed um, to derive the current transport theory with and without mass corrections. So first part, a little bit much more conceptual. Second part, I'm sorry, it's technical work after all, so it's a little bit more technical. I will avoid, avoid or going into very much uh, deep technical details, but you can always ask me now or after the talk, of course. Um, well, this is based on works uh, that I have here, the references uh, that are published. Okay, let us start by the very simple thing about the fact that uh, there are three types of relativistic fermions. This is probably something that you very well known, but let us recall it here. Um, there are the typical Dirac fermions, the, the fermions that Dirac had in mind when deriving uh, the Dirac equation. Uh, it's a fermion like the electron, a massive fermion. But after the proposal of the Dirac equation, Weil realized that there were some peculiar properties of these relativistic fermions in the massless limits, in the massless limits. So we talk about then Weil fermions. And then, well, there are the so-called Majorana fermions um, uh, that are fermions that happen to be their own antiparticle. So this talk is mainly about wild fermions, okay, and, and deriving a transport theory approach for wild fermions, but uh, about how to incorporate mass corrections as well. Well, wild fermions. Um, first of all, one has to say that from all the elementary particles we know, uh, none, of, none of the fermions of the elementary particles are really massless. Okay, no, uh, at some time neutrinos were thought were thought to be massless, but we know that this is no longer the case. So none of them is a wild fermion. However, uh, they were massless before before the electroweak phase transition. So all these ideas I'm going to tell you about can be applied in this cosmological time before the electroweak phase transition took place. However, all of them can be taken as almost massless 
in very extreme conditions. So if we have a many body system um, characterized by uh, temperature T, oh, sorry, oh, sorry, my mouse is too, okay, sorry. So if we have a many body system uh, characterized by a high temperature T or a large density with a chemical potential mu, and this, I'm sorry, with this mouse, <laughs> I should not touch it. Okay, so uh, when the temperature of the chemical potential of the system is much larger than the fermion mass, mm -hmm. most of the fermions have momenta of the order of, of the temperature of the chemical potential, we can well approximate the relativistic energy by its massless limit. So all these ideas I'm going to tell you about can also be applied in these situations of extreme conditions that may happen in cosmological settings, in astrophysical scenarios, or even in the quark-gluon plasma. Also, all these ideas also applied to condensed matter systems, because in some of these systems, it happens that there are some quasi-particle excitations that behave as relativistic massless fermions. These are specific... Oh, sorry, I'm not doing anything. Only... I'm very sorry. Um, uh, these are the so-called wild semi-metals. And these this, this are now become a topic very, very... Well, very, very hot. I mean, a lot of people working on it. Okay, let me then tell you what is so special about this massless limit of, of relativistic fermions. Well, the main idea is that they have a well-defined chirality, um, and the chirality in the massless case equals to the elicity of, of the fermion. The elicity, I would recall you, is the projection of the momenta of the particle over the direction of, the, of its spin. If they are parallel, we say that the fermion is right-handed, and if they are anti-parallel, we say that the fermion is left-handed. So these massless fermions have a well-defined projection, uh, uh, well-defined elicity, or, or well-defined chirality. Imagine a situation where we have a different number of right-handed and left-handed fermions, then we can talk about a chiral density, uh, rho 5, which is uh, obtained after subtracting the density of right-handed uh, density of right-handed fermions minus the left-handed. In the, I'm very sorry. This is, um, in, in classical theory, um, if the interactions of the of your fermions respect chirality, the chiral density will be conserved. However, we know that as soon as we consider quantum effects, this is no longer the case. And this, is, this was discovered in the late 60s uh, by studying this famous triangle diagram. It was then discovered that, that the chiral current is no longer is not conserved as soon as quantum effects are considered, but rather uh, the conservation law tells you that in the presence of electromagnetic fields, these are the electromagnetic field tensors, this is no longer zero. In quantum field theory at zero temperature and zero density, the quantum chiral anomaly appears as the impossibility for massless fermions to keep um, in the regulated theory both the gauge symmetry and the chiral symmetry. So after the discovery of this quantum chiral anomaly, um, people realized that they, were, they could give explanation of many different uh, anomalous decays. The most famous one is uh, that corresponding to the neutral pion decaying into, into two photons. In the last 10-15 years, 
people have realized that uh, the quantum chiral anomaly will also have a clear impact in, uh, in the hydrodynamics of the systems for a many body system made, of, made up of massless fermions. I would recall you that hydrodynamical equations are simply equations of conservation laws. So in systems uh, with massless fermions, when quantum effects have to be considered, we have to take into account this chiral anomaly equation into the description of the whole system. And then we, we talk about chiral hydrodynamics or anomalous hydrodynamics, essentially is the, is the same. Okay, so all this chiral transport theory that I'm going to tell you about is about having a microscopic approach that allow us to go from this microscopic description of, of the fermions characterized by a distribution function, classical distribution function, in most cases, in description of classical systems, that tells you the probability of finding a particle in one given space and one given point of phase space. So how from this description, we can go to the macroscopic description of hydrodynamics when we have equations that tell us the evolution of the energy momentum tensor or, or of the currents. And this is this chiral transport theory. Um, a little bit about, um, about motivation of why this is interesting is that once you consider all these effects um, in the game, in systems made up of massless fermions, there is a bunch of new transport phenomena, current transport phenomena, very interesting. I think I'm not going to spend a lot of time here uh, because I know that in a couple of weeks you will have also a seminar mainly devoted to this kind of transport phenomena by Lance Steiner, I, I believe, that he might tell you much more in detail um, what all this kind of transport phenomena is, is about. For example, this uh, one, a couple of them is, is this famous kind of magnetic effect that tells you that in the presence of misbalance between the population of right-handed and left-handed fermions and in the presence of an uh, external magnetic field, you have an electromagnetic current that is uh, in the direction of the magnetic field. Same happens with the fluid vorticity. Um, I'm rather going to concentrate on, on the formalism in this talk. Uh, about how to derive this kind of transport theory, I have to say that there, there, are, well, there have been a bunch of groups uh, doing this, this work of deriving this formalism, kind of transport theory, with different approaches. All these approaches um, that are very well established for classical physics, all these approaches of, of getting kind of transport theory is about getting quantum corrections to the classical uh, transport theory. And there are a set different ways of doing that. Um, also, people have considered the possibility of including some small mass corrections or even studying the same thing for pretty massive fermions. Mm -hmm. And I have a, some list of references here. I'm not going to cover all the different possibilities of getting to this trans kind of transport theory. I will concentrate on our work and how it well, I will fo focus on how it differs from others. Um, and I will suggest that if you are much more interested in, 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 in seeing other approaches, there's a res uh, re review article uh, that you covers all, all the different uh, approaches. I will start uh, before entering into how to get into this uh, semi-classical transport uh, theory, I will tell you about the semi-classical limits of quantum relativistic uh, physics. Um, these are very subtle. And this, this is something that it was very soon realized 
after the proposal of the Dirac equation. Um, the fact is that the Dirac equation uh, for the fermions mixes up the evolution of the positive energy eigenstates and the negative energy eigenstates. And if one wants to have some sort of semi-classical interpretation of the Dirac equation, one uh, soon uh, meets puzzles. And this, this was what people were uh, facing after, after the, the proposal of the Dirac equation. For example, one of them is that um, even if one, if one considers a free Dirac fermion, a Dirac particle, this does not move along a straight line with constant velocity, but rather carries out a dancing motion, what goes under the name of Zitterbewegung. This is a German word. I'm sorry for the pronunciation. I'm, so, I'm sure it's not pronounced this way, but I'm doing my best. So the, the Dirac particle carries out this Zitterbewegung, which are oscillations centered on a point that moves uh, uniformly and oscillations at the speed of light. This Zitterbewegung is something that probably most of us studied when uh, studying the Dirac equation itself. Probably you don't remember, and I have a slide to uh, recall it. What is the Zitterbewegung? Uh, if you have the Dirac Hamiltonian, uh, C is the speed of light, alpha is one Dirac matrix, mm -hmm. beta is also a Dirac matrix, and gamma zero. If you take into account commutation relations of the space, space to space variables and the anti commutation relations of the Dirac matrices, you soon you could get the Hamiltonian equations for x and p, you will find that uh, in, in the Heisenberg picture of quantum mechanics, that the trajectory of the particle has a part which might have a proper semi-classical interpretation, but this has this other part, which is these oscill oscill oscillations this dancing motion that we are talking about, this Zeta Bewegung, that is, it's there. Well, it was only in the 50s when uh, Foldy and Bautism, I'm sorry if I probably am not pronouncing correctly uh, these names, um, realized that they could re, could could get rid of these Zeta Bewegung oscillations by diagonalizing the Dirac Hamiltonian. Um, these authors were actually interested in getting the non relativistic limit of the Dirac uh, Hamiltonian and the Dirac uh, equation. Uh, and they, they, they saw that they could, the proper way to do that was diagonalizing the Dirac Hamiltonian, separating particles and antiparticles degrees of freedom. They realized that they could do such a diagonalization exactly for the free theory, but only as an expansion in 1 over m, m being the, the fermion mass, in this case, because they were interested in the relativistic limit, m is the larger scale of the problem. Uh, so for an interacting theory, this diagonalization was done as an expansion in 1 over m. So after this separation, there is no Zeta uh, Bewegung. And then, even, the, even though the interest was getting the non-relativistic limit, they realized that their uh, diagonalized uh, formulation of the Dirac Hamiltonian or the Dirac uh, physics could have a proper semi-classical interpretation. The point is that in doing this diagonalization, their new particles, which are diagonalized with respect to the Dirac particles, have an special extent. Um, 
and the length of this scale is, is, is exactly the radius of the Sita Vivero. Well, as said, all, that, all this was discussed for massive particles to get the non-relativistic limit. What I will tell you is that all this can be generalized to the massless case as well. And this is essentially what we have done. I will recall you then the following. Uh, you have your Dirac equation. You can always carry out some canonical or unitary transformations to your Hamiltonian, okay? And then also to the wave function, to the Dirac wave function. And then in principle, if you do things properly, you will be describing the same physics, no matter whether you are in the rotated or unrotated uh, framework. Um, however, there are like two preferred pictures, at least in relativistic uh, quantum mechanics. There is the Dirac picture, the picture that uh, Dirac developed, which is interesting in many respects. Essentially, I would say, this is my personal point of view, because you have minimal coupling. So you know how to uh, incorporate uh, electromagnetic fields by simply uh, changing your derivatives to covariant derivatives. In this rotated picture, however, you don't have minimal coupling. Uh, you will have Lagrangians with electromagnetic fields, magnetic moments, uh, the divergences of uh, electromagnetic fields, etc. In the direct picture, your states are point-like, but they have this Sitter Bewegung. In this other picture, you have extended objects of radius, the quantum wavelength, which is the radius of the Sitter Bewegung. Another thing which is interesting is that in the direct picture, um, the spin itself suffers Sitter Bewegung and is not conserved, the sum of the spin angular momentum, the total angular momentum is conserved. In this rotated picture, we will have also to rotate the spin operator, one can see that the, the spin is conserved. Well, so all what I have said so far is somehow well known. Um, and we have to keep it in mind if we want to, to, to derive transfer equations for relativistic fermions from quantum field theory or from quantum mechanics or relativistic quantum mechanics. Actually, in the 90s, um, when trying to do this game of deriving transfer equations from relativistic quantum, or relativistic quantum mechanics or or quantum field theory, they were concerned about these, uh, these oscillations. Uh, I will tell you more specifically what uh, the problems one may face. Uh, and one way to get rid out of them will be is that in your final uh, equations, you get rid of these oscillations by introducing a course reigning that eliminates them, okay? So this was discussed in the 90s. I, however, see that people now are doing this uh, derivation of quantum field theory, and there's not much discussion <laughs> about this, uh, this, this, this little problem. Because in principle, you have to introduce some uh, uh, eventually coarse graining that will eliminate uh, such, a, such, a, such these oscillations. And, this, and then this introduces, this, if you introduce a coarse graining, and necessarily you introduce a, a scale in your problem, a minimal scale. Um, what we have done is trying to derive this current transport theory using 
the four devolution principles of diagonalizing and separating particles and antiparticles. And we have done this for massless fermions in three different ways. Um, first, at the Hamiltonian level, in a very similar way as the original authors for the devotees indeed, realizing that this diagonalization can be done in powers of h bar and not only in powers of 1 over m. If we are, um, and this is what we will do, uh, use quantum field theory, we can also diagonalize the Lagrangian in a spirit very similar to, 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 to the same thing that you do at the Hamiltonian level. But what is much more interesting for us is, and, and, and then I will devote now the time for the rest of this talk, is doing this using effective field theory methods. Um, actually, uh, sorry, may I ask a question? Sure. Uh, thank you. So, I just would like to understand. So, uh, this Foldwood Hoytson, I don't know whether this is correct pronunciation, but. Yeah, but is, I probably don't pronounce it correctly. Uh, yeah, I would like to ask you the question that um, uh, is it a non-relativistic uh, approximation? Because, firstly, you say that it is a 1 over m expansion, but now yeah. you are I mean, saying it is. It is a power of h bar, so it is non relativistic or it is uh, semi classical. When it was done the very first time, it was done as a non non relativistic expansion. 1 over m is actually a non relativistic expansion. But um, what we've done actually, it, I believe it was uh, in, in, in the early 2000s, I don't have the reference can also be done in an h-bar expansion without the need to, to go to the massless limit. I have some back, back, uh, some slides at, at the end of the talk, and I can show you exactly how to, uh, how to do it. Um, because, well, if you want, I can do it now. Um, no, it's I, okay, okay, I will wait for your book, so thank you very much. Yeah, the okay. point is, this is the first way we did it, but when, then we realized that we could do it with effective field theory methods. And the effective field theory methods are much more powerful in the sense that um, people have used these effective field theory methods uh, for a long time and they have developed uh, a lot of tools that we can borrow and use them and show how things are much more systematic. Um, but Actually, we first did it with in this way, and inspired by non-relativistic QD, non-relativistic QD is an effective field theory method that does what faulty bautism did at the Hamiltonian level in relativistic quantum mechanics. So essentially, we did the same, uh, but without the need of doing a non-relativistic expansion. So, and this is what I will describe in the rest of, of the talk, okay? We have to say that now our particles also have this length. Now is not, the length is not uh, the quantum wavelength because we have massless particles, it's rather the de Broglie wavelength, one over E, okay? So let me tell you about this on-shell effective field theory that we developed to, to do this diagonalization. So we, we want to describe phenomena dominated by on-shell degrees of freedom. So we, we focus now on the massless case. So we can define an on-shell fermion dividing its momenta by an on-shell part E is the energy and V is, is a velocity, a Lyapunov vector, V squared equals 1. And then we will have here a residual momenta, K mu, which is much less, much less than the energy. This is a momenta that the particle might get by interacting with other 
particles through electromagnetic interactions in this case. And for the antiparticles, we'll do the same with a minus here and with a p tilde, which is also a light like vector like this. Then the Dirac fermion field, we split it like, the, like this. We define particle and antiparticle projectors. So we define a field, which is, 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 is described the particle. We write first the dependence on the larger scale of the problem here. And in this field, we have the residual dependence. I'm using the same terminology as in other effective field theories. This is the residual momentum. And this will be antiparticle of shell degrees of freedom. Here I define my own shell antiparticle with such a dependence here. And here we will have the off shell particle associated to this dependence. OK, so uh, once you have this direct field, you plug it in the QED Lagrangian, and you can de derive um, classical equations of motion to these off-shell parts, H1 and H2, and solve the classical equations of motion. Then you substitute the solution into the QED Lagrangian, and you end, and end up with a Lagrangian for the particle and antiparticle fields, which are totally decoupled. Okay. In principle, the direct structure is simpler than the that that one corresponded to QED. It's only that you have a non-local term in the Lagrangian here. So in the Lagrangian, you have covariant derivatives in a projector over the direction of this lilac vector. Okay. And then you have this non-local piece here, and d slash perp is a covariant der derivative, which is perpendicular to these v and v tilde fields. Okay, same for the par particles and antiparticles. It's curious that the form of the Lagrangian is very similar to. The Lagrangian of another effective field theory, that of soft collinear effective field theory, which is used um, for other purposes, I mean, describing essentially the physics of jets, of very energetic jets. Well, now the problem is that you start with a Lagrangian which is uh, very short, and now you have this uh, structure which is kind of complicated. However, if E, the energy, is the largest scale of the problem. If E is very large, you can span this operator and, and then you get uh, 1 over E expansion, which is um, local, etc. You will do, uh, let me briefly mention, if you were doing the same things for non-relativistic QED, you will do something very similar, and it will be M, the mass of the fermion, that will enter into a non-local operator and that you span also to get the, the proper uh, physics. OK. Well, as I said, I will be brief because otherwise I won't have uh, much time. We have done this integrated out of off-shell degrees of freedom, but also at the Lagrangian level you can obtain the same Lagrangian by diagonalization. By diagonalizing, by, I won't go into very much detail, but I will simply mention here, rotating your with uh, Dirac, Fermi, Dirac fields, okay? And then projecting, you will, you, well, we have checked at least up to second order in the energy expansion that we will yield the same, the same Lagrangian as done using this integrating out um, philosophy. Um, something that I want to recall and what is very typical of all these foldable decent pictures 
um, I'm insisting all the time, is that what you call particle here is a combination, non-local combination, as you see you have all these derivatives here, of what you call a Dirac particle, a particle in the Dirac field. So you have a combination of uh, particles and antiparticles. And, well, because after all this, this seminar was about uh, introducing the small mass corrections, you can always uh, re repeat the same, the same analysis if you include a small mass in the QED Lagrangian. A small mass means that you can consider that this is um, much smaller than the energy of the particle, so that you can treat it as a perturbative parameter in your game, so you treat it as a perturbation, and and then you have to keep in mind that the mass term breaks the Kyle symmetry, okay? But the mass term also in the Dirac Lagrangian connects particles and antiparticles. Well, if you repeat the same philosophy of of obtaining uh, this Osef Lagrangian by integrating out, you will have to add two new pieces proportional to the mass, which are not local, but we also span uh, in one over e. One piece respects scalarity. It's easy to see that the piece that is proportional to the mass breaks scalarity. But in the expansion in 1 over e, this is a commutator, it only appears at second order. Another important point in these effective fifth theory methods is the so-called reparametrization invariance. What, what is this? Okay, so you start with, uh, with a QED Lagrangian, which does not have any vector defined there. And after all these manipulations I've done, I end up with a Lagrangian which has two vectors, V and V tilde. Okay, so it seems that you are breaking Lorentz invariance. Mm -hmm. It turns out that you can check that, uh, I mean, in the effective field theory, you could treat this V and V tilde as also as some sort of parameters, vectors that are parameters. Um, you can check that if you change slightly the values of V or of V tilde, you can also change, uh, swallow, uh, and you do it in the way that uh, you, you still keep the, the properties of being lightlike. Okay, so you can these infinitesimal changes in the in the vector v and v tilde can be swallowed in the definition of uh, in the definition of the residual momenta. Okay, so if you demand that under these changes of the parameters v and v tilde, these vectors, uh, the Dirac field is the same, you can actually check um, that the Osef Lagrangian is invariant. This is something that has been studied for soft collinear effective field theory by Manohar et al. And, and it has been, well, all these small changes in, this, in these parameters can be written in terms of rotations and boosts, okay? So these changes are combinations of rotations and boosts, after all. And, well, what happens is that when you do these changes explicitly for the so-called type two, uh, type two transformations, which are combinations of rotations and boost. If you take these vectors in the direction, in the third direction, type two is combination of a rotation uh, along the second axis and a boost uh, uh, along the, the, the x axis. So that 
feel associated to the particle have to transform in a non-local way and if you further introduce a mass and introduce chirality with these chiral, chiral projectors in order for the osef lagrangian to be invariant under this reparameterization these changes of the vectors v the field has to transform in a way that does not respect chirality. This might sound at first like shocking, but might be understood from the fact that our particles contain also off-shell modes, particles and antiparticles, which have the two chiralities. This might be a sound a little bit uh, too abstract, but it turns out that to understand transformation properties of current transport theory, um, we see that we can derive it from this reparameterization invariance that the theory, the effective field theory has. Well, so now we have the effective field theory and from it we can construct and derive the chiral kinetic theory. So um, this has to be done using real-time formalism of quantum field theory that I won't go I won't go into the details of that uh, might be too too heavy but I will tell you the very basic um, ingredients that you need for this derivation. First of all you have to, de to define your two-point functions in our case, are two-point two point functions associated to our fields, basic fields. This is different if we were, if we were starting from the Dirac field, uh, and having here the, the complete Dirac field, a two-point function like this one will mix up particles and antiparticles. In our case, because we don't, if we we're simply taking the particle sector, um, um, we'll see that in a direct decomposition of these two-point functions, uh, we don't have a scalar and pseudo-scalar components, um, but uh, we only, ha only have vectorial, axial, and tensorial components. An important um, point about the direct picture is that because at this level you have this mixing uh, from a two-point function I will define this classical pro or probability distribution functions if we have these zeta Beckman oscillations um, the corresponding function might be negative due to this zeta Beckman. so in this way we are I mean in our case uh, uh, we should be safe from, from these problems. Okay, so we, have, we define these two-point functions and we only have vectorial, axial, and tensorial components. We have, we define an, a scalar function, G, that might be right-handed or left-handed by taking the, the trace of this combination. And we have tensorial components parameterized by these functions, the scalar functions uh, phi and phi daiga obtained in this way and perpendicular are combinations of unitary vectors which are perpendicular to, to V and I wouldn't explain much because these particular combinations we have here the so-called wedge products um, Define, I don't see it here at the end, like like here. Um, why these uh, so peculiar combinations? It turns out that um, this um, these combinations of uh, Dirac matrices, the sigma matrix and the chiral chiral, chiral projectors project. Uh, self-dual, anti-self-dual components of, of, of the function. It's a little bit mathematical, I won't 
spend much time here, only tell you that we have four scalar functions, left-handed and right-handed, and these two scalar functions, phi and phi uh, daga. And if we were describing only particles, this, all, this is all what we need. For antiparticles, we will need for other more. All what I'm going, all what I'm going to say about particles um, can be said for antiparticles. I mean, everything is, is pretty similar. I'm focusing only on the particles. Well, these G functions define well-defined chiral states or left-handed and right-handed particles. These other tensorial components define the so-called quantum spin coherent states, which are related to combinations of right-handed and left-handed um, fields like this one. Mm -hmm. And this is something that in classical physics you, you wouldn't have. These quantum coherent states were first introduced um, in the studies of neutrino transport by, by these authors. Well, so in principle, as soon as we have um, these two point functions, we, uh, to reach to a, well, you have to do it using the real time formalism, blah, 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 won't go into much detail. You can, from these two point, point, point functions, you define a big net transformation, gauge covariantly modified to respect, uh, to respect the gauge symmetry which essentially is um, uh, doing this transformation. These are Wilson lines uh, to respect uh, the symmetries. So essentially you define a center of mass coordinate and then a relative coordinate, and you do some, some, somehow a Fourier transformation of this relative coordinate, but modified in such a way so as to respect uh, the symmetry. So, in our formulation of the observed, and using all the recipes, well-established recipes, to deduce from quantum field theory, transport theory, we can then der derive dynamical equations and also on-shell on conditions for all these functions in an expansion in 1 over E. Mm -hmm. So, then you have all to carry out a credit expansion and at the end of the day rather than having functions in terms of the residual momenta you may want to go back to to the full momenta in, in your formulation well so this is pretty technical and la 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 laborious i will just mainly jump to the form of transport equation obey by this G can be written down in terms of a classical distribution function or something that may have a, a, the same meaning of, of a classical distribution function times a delta function. And this Q is the on-shell condition that tells you what is the dispersion law of your particles. It turns out that dispersion law, if you go to one over uh, to second order in the in the one over e expansion uh, happens that the, the the dispersion law is displaced from the pure massless free case to having uh, a correction which depends on of the on the magnetic field and on the chirality of the particle. Then this distribution function obeys this equation here. These operators are typical derivative times uh, energy moment by the electromagnetic field tensor, and this is derivative with respect to the momenta, and this, this has the appearance. I have devoted a lot of time to, to explain the difference between the Dirac picture and this other picture, because to our surprise, when, when we derived all this, well, we, we did all this work, um, we didn't get exactly the same form of transport equation. Um, 
the difference comes in terms that depend on the magnetic field here. And it took us a lot of time a lot, and a lot of headaches and a lot of discussions with people um, trying to understand why uh, uh, we were getting something different. I mean, this is derived from QED in an H bar expansion. This is derived from this effective field theory in this 1 over E expansion. It turns out that the two transfer equations are correct, but the two of them are valid for different degrees of freedom. These are valid for these Dirac particles. These are valid for these um, extended objects. And what happens if we include, I mean, this is for the massless case. Uh, now we have done the same thing for the massive uh, case. In the massive case, the dispersion law of the particles is modified, including a small mass corrections. Okay, And we have a set also tensorial components. Uh, at, at this order, tensorial and vectorial components are also disentangled. They are mixed at higher orders, but at this order, we can find also a transfer equation for the vectorial and the tensorial components. And they are totally decoupled. Hmm. However, to our surprise, um, the two of them are related by this reparameterization invariance transformations which at the end of the day is Lorentz uh, transformations. So this one of these reparameterization invariant transformation, this so-called type 2 transformation, tell us that this distribution function that in classical field phi is typically a scalar, is not a scalar anymore if you apply this combination of rotations and boost. And then Rather than a scalar, you have a new term. This is the so-called side jump term that these authors first discussed in discussing color kinetic theory. S mu nu is the spin tensor of your particle, and this is the famous operator that appears in the transfer equation. So we have found that the tensorial components do not suffer this side jump. But rather, um, we see that tensorial and vectorial components do get mixed when we have this uh, special combination of rotations and, and, and boost. Well, another interesting thing, I will be fast, is that now we have this transport theory and we may like to see what the macroscopic variables of the system um, look like in terms of our scalar and tensorial uh, and vectorial and tensorial components. And we see that these tensorial components that so far uh, uh, have not been much discussed in the literature uh, en enter both in the scalar density in the vector current or in the axial current of the system. More peculiarly, um, they are the leading term in 1 over E in the so-called pseudo-scalar density of your system. This is, as said before, only for particles, and the particles will have a similar, a similar contribution that I have not written down here. Well, and then if we consider both particles and antiparticle contribution of, of the to the system, we have checked that with our transport formalism, we can uh, obtain the consistent form of the chiral anomaly equation, including mass corrections with a pseudo scalar density. And as I said before, here is this. Uh, quantum coherent states will, will enter. Well, now I will be very brief because um, we've 
also studied in the past, but only in the M equals zero case, the derivation of, 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 of the collision terms in the transport equation. And even chirality is conserved. We have found that in general, uh, the collision terms that we, we have derived um, depend both on the chirality of the fermion and the elicity of the photon. If we have a system where we have uh, an imbalance of right-handed and left-handed fermions, um, photons get a different evolution for the different two uh, elicities of the photon. And this brings a very interesting phenomena. For example, we have checked that the lifetime or damping term of a fermion is different uh, in a system with current imbalance for left-handed and right-handed fermions. Or, for example, that the collision energy loss of a fermion tra traversing uh, a system with chiral misbalance is also something that depends on the elicity of the fermion. Well, these are somehow applications of all these ideas for, for these interesting uh, systems. Okay, so I think I will more or less finish here. Uh, I will recall you the main ideas with effective Ethereum methods. We have derived quantum corrections to classical transport equations, which correspond to this faulty voltism approach to relativistic quantum mechanics in the massless case. Even for the first time, they were deduced for, to obtain the non-relativistic limit. And that all these effective Ethereum approaches are powerful in the sense that they can be pushed um, for higher accuracy. I brought only the transfer equation at order two. In principle, one could go uh, to push it to higher orders. And in particular, if you have a small mass, you can also use them to, to see what is the effect of these small mass corrections in, in kinetic theory. And I believe this is more or less all what I wanted to say. And if you have questions, I'm happy to, to address them. And if not, I some back, back up slides where I tell you about this diagonalization in an HVAR expansion, as you wish. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for this talk. Uh, is there any question? Uh, yes, I have one uh, question. Uh, it is about the previous slide, actually, when you have shown uh, these two uh, pictures concerning uh, inverse of lifetime of uh, left-handed versus right-handed uh, fermions. Mm -hmm. So, so is this like is there any experiment that can can address this kind of uh, imbalance between the, the the two types of fermions? Okay, um, for weight semi metals, we hope so. Um, we have actually studied this collisional energy loss because in, in these heavy ion collisions, okay, one expects to recreate a system where there's some chiral misbalance. And actually, in these systems, uh, people study this. Um, how jets of particles lose energy um, this, uh, through this phenomena of jet quenching. Mm -hmm. Okay. So our, our study was motivated by the fact that if in these experiments, one could check a difference of this energy loss between fermions of different elicity, it would be 
a signature that you have kind of misbalance. However, this is the theory. <laughs> In practice, I've talked to some experimentalists, this is very difficult to measure. But okay, I'm a theoretician. I first think about, uh, uh, about these ideas and... I see. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Is there any other questions? May I ask a further question, if possible? Um, in one of the slides in the middle of the talk, um, you you argued about this um, Lorentz, uh, Lorentz breaking or Lorentz violating theory. But there were some um, uh, boosts and, uh, right? If we, so, which boosts they are? I mean, are they the last? Uh, yeah, thank you. Exactly this slide. So the, these uh, generators, right? This is a combination of generators, this Q1 plus minus. Mm -hmm. So uh, this J1 is a, is a um, rotation. rotation. Ah, okay. And this Ks are uh, Boost. uh, just boosts. But these are Lorentz boosts or so something different because uh, uh, wh wh how... how uh, Lorentz invariance is broken here. I, that's, uh, I would like to, if this boosts are Lorentz boost, so what is broken? No, I say that naively, it seems naively, I mean, naively, in QD you don't have any vector. Okay? You have uh, the covariant derivative and, and that's it. But in the effective field theory, we have a defined vector here, V, and V tilde. And here you have these perpendicular covariant derivatives in the direction of V. So we started from Q QED, which does not have any vector. And now I'm telling you that after integrating out and all that, I end up with a theory which has some vectors. Okay. So it seems it seems that okay, that now the sim the the Lorentz symmetry, well, maybe, I mean, that so the Lorentz symmetry is broken. Okay, Be because you have a defined vector in the QED Lagrangian. Uh, uh, so you mean that it is a vector, it's a three vector which doesn't transform under Lorentz transformation. So it's transforming under something different. Should I understand something like this, or mm. uh, the, by vector you mean because you know that I mean the vector if it, there is a four vector which is I mean which is allowed by Lorentz right symmetry. So if you have a Lorentz, if you plug, if you plug this velocity there, huh, okay, uh -huh. okay, it seems that now um, you are breaking. If I if I choose v and we tilde like this, okay? It seems that now you have breaking the, the symmetry that you had in the theory. Oh, okay, this is a particular choice of this. Okay, 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 thank you, thank you. I am not sure if there are any other questions. If not, uh, we can thank again our speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for accepting our invitations again and for this nice talk. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So. I hope Maybe, oh. we meet in Paris. <laughs> I have so. <laughs> okay. And we, we have another seminar in two weeks, I think. Uh -huh. On what, on which topic? It would be mathematics. I think um, 
something related to uh, operator theory. theory. Uh, but okay, uh, the speaker uh, did not yet send the title, so I'm not so sure what uh, would be exactly. <laughs> okay, very good. Okay. Okay. So, thank have you. a good day. And, thank you. Uh, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.